bit of information that we're sharing now is that it's a lot smaller. Um, and one of the challenges of that is, is filtering out those units and, and targeting readers and, and people to precisely the unit of information that contains the most um, valuable um, information for them. Which also redefines the role of a publishing house like Nature as well, if you want. Yeah, you can become something like an information scout, a cross-media information scout, instead of just publishing journals. Absolutely, and this is something that you know Nature's been experimenting with for some time. Like the blogs on Nature com page, for example. But I mean, bloggers know how this works too. I mean, people write a blog, but they also list blog roles. Mm -hmm. They know that they're not operating in a vacuum, and they know that they're cross-referencing to other people. You know, scientists know that that's how things work. Okay, I think we had another question over here. Yeah, just from my, uh, from my background, uh, we talked about how uh, non-scientists can get in contact with uh, research uh, results. And just from my background, what do you say, how many percentage uh, of the topics is really hard nature science? Because I think that's really like some topic a normal person wouldn't understand. But if you go into social science, maybe... Uh, like for a journalist, you're always looking for maybe studies and, um, and what do you say, how many percent is nature science and how many is social science or can you, you have an overview about that? Yes, um, I, can, I can tell you how many, it may be easier to tell you how many users are like how the percentage of users from each discipline. Yeah. So the, the top two are biology and medicine and research gate. Um, yeah. They account around 40% of all, you know, um, of all the users in ResearchGate. The third one is uh, computer science, then physics, chemistry, and then social science. Mm -hmm. um, I think it reflects somehow also the natural distribution. Like if you look at the numbers, how many scientists you have in each of the uh, each of these disciplines, it somehow reflects. I think social science could be stronger, I would say. Um, but um, yeah, but as you say, as you're saying, the discussions in the social science groups are very long, very detailed, um, mm -hmm. and you uh, you can read through them, mm -hmm. and they're interesting. And if you look at the biology discussion, they are very like short, yeah. because of the fact that you don't want to share too much information. That you, you want that the person, you know, it's a somewhere a trade-off between uh, the person sh has to understand what you're doing, but on the other hand, you don't want to share too much that they exactly know what you're doing. So it's in many cases a very, very clear technical question uh, which gets very clear technical answers it's a I think it's also yeah it's one of the challenges we have to build a, to build a platform where everyone thinks well wow, that's something what I can use and yeah this is one of the big challenges we have no 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 less 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 um, less than 10 percent. I, I, can, I don't have. If you you can send me an email, I can send you the exact numbers if you're interested. I think it's on the starting page of ResearchGate as well. There's a graph. Yeah. Who's first? You didn't say it. Okay. Um, my name is Sebastian. I'm working for a research network um, for biodiversity research. Um, my um, experience was that. Scientists are not really interested in building up networks. So that was my personal uh, experience because I'm doing that um, um, all the time, <laughs> and I, I try to force people to do it. And um, so my question was, who are these? I guess it was three percent of, of scientists who are already working with, with um, 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 open science. Uh, what kind of Personal structure is it? Are there, is it a younger generation or? And, um, we see also the users in research here, and you can tell from them what I what the, the average, like the, the most of the users on average are between 24 and 30 years old. It's the somewhere the new generation which is come, the new generation which is coming and using the you know these tools as a, as a daily tool um, and it's, and even. It's the same story which I said when I, my prof when I asked my professor if he wants to do, use the social networking site. It's just not in, in his mind using it. You know, for him it's Google and email and the papers. And, and now the generation which is coming now, they have already Facebook um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a social networking tool. And then ResearchGate or Mendeley or Nature Networks is coming, which is, you know, somewhere, you know, 
a new social networking tool. I would like, like if if it would we have started ResearchGate, I don't know, five years ago, I think it wouldn't have any users now, because no one had, would have understood what is ResearchGate. If you now tell the people, it's like even if I look back when we started around three years ago, it was I had to explain much more what ResearchGate is as I have to do now. Like if we go to, to conferences, then I say, yeah, we are a scientific network, then everyone, ah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, but I think you're right. I think the um, the general um, the, the ge this researcher himself or herself in general is more closed. Um, this is what I also experience. Um, I I was in, in Boston at, at MGH, which is a Harvard Medical School affiliation, and you you were there as well. You see, the people are very close, so they want to have their successes, etc. But I think all the pub like Facebook, Twitter. All the tools changing the people, how they're using the tools in in their normal life and in their scientific life. If I tell my professor I'm using Facebook to share photos with my friends, yeah, you are crazy. Why do you share photos with your friends? He would never. He would never do it. Even my parents tell me, why do you share this publicly with a thousand friends? And it's yeah, it's changing. And I think also this will change also in science, and and this will come step by step. I think Lou wanted to, to co comment on that here. Lou, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about the use of all these online tools as well, and, and especially things that concern social media, is they've been very much hyped. You know, we're very much interested. We're always hearing about big numbers. You know, how many tens of thousands of tweets are produced a minute? How many, you know, millions of people that, that we might be able to reach? But I think what we also need to ask is a, is a question of community and, you know, what is the size of an ideal community and, and the number of people that we're expecting to engage. And if you think about how science is actually carried out and pick a particular research area, then within a specialist topic, there's not necessarily more than a certain number of people, perhaps, you know, tens, hundreds of people working in that particular area at any one time. And so you wouldn't necessarily expect that in building these communities online and engaging in conversations around the science of them, that you would expect the communities to be any larger than that. And there have been various discussions about this. I mean, you've probably heard of Dunbar's number and this idea that 150 is, is perhaps the magic number of people that um, we can maintain meaningful connections with um, in real life. There's some debate about whether or not this is actually true online. Um, we know, for example, for experiments that Nature have done, we used to run things like virtual conferences in Second Life. And we found with those that, um, you know, there was a maximum capacity of 100 people. But this was also about the right size that you could actually have everybody present able to network with everybody else present. And given that what is at the centre of these, these social media um, activities it is the, the social side, the conversation and the exchanging of information, then perhaps what we're really looking at is a collection of sub-communities. So lots of communities of, say, 100 scientists in size who are talking about their specialist areas. And that when we're talking about more mainstream media, we're actually trying to do something different. And that's not necessarily the scientific process. That's actually communicating more about it and, and opening it up more widely. Whether it's communities or sub-communities, would you say that, as the question before, um, that these people who engage are, let's say, different from those who don't? I think there's definitely a case of having early adopters for technology. We've definitely seen that there are people that um, are perhaps more um, open-minded and, and more willing. But I mean, you, you see that among the people that you know anyway. There are people that are, are more gregarious, more um, willing and open to share information. We definitely haven't seen either that it is necessarily confined just to the younger age groups. We've had people who are PIs, professors, blogging on Nature Network and getting involved in conversations. Um, so it isn't just a stereotype that they are necessarily just young people that are interested in these things. Okay.
we have, uh, so the top four countries who we presented on ResearchGate are US, Germany, sorry, US, UK, Germany, India. Um, and so it was the third thing. Ah, and the uh, user growth. We had, as a comparison, we had a one, one year and a half ago, we had per day 100 new signups. So every day 100 new registrations. And now we have per day three and a half thousand new registrations per day. Now, and another number maybe which is interesting um, from the 100 registrations that we had a year and a half ago per day, there were like around 5% via invitation. And now we have 40% of the signups per day are via invitation. So other people joining ResearchGate inviting their friends to join ResearchGate. ResearchGate is still free of charge as far as I know, Nature Network as well. Um, at least I'm not paying anything, I think. <laughs> um, is that going to stay that way? Yes. For how long? Forever. Okay, but you're a company. Yeah, uh, we have um, other revenue ideas um, and revenue streams. I can share them openly. Um, one is a job board. So we have a scientific job market uh, where companies can post their job offers. Uh, right now, it's free um, for companies and um, um, for academia. At one point, we will introduce featuring of job posts for, for companies, and then the companies have to pay for, for um, posting or featuring the job, this job offers. Again, free for the user to look at the job offers um, and get a comprehensive list of all the jobs which are existing in this field. But the company have you know has to pay for that um, to get into the listings. One part. Um, the second idea is around uh, private communities. So um, we uh, building within we're building research gates in research gates. Um, so we're having private uh, communities within research gate for institutions for large institutions. One example is the Max Planck Society, who is using research gate as a communication platform, which is integrated in the worldwide system. Um, one, it's a, f a good example because uh, the Max Planck Society built up their own network, but no one used this network because the critical mass you have in one institution is just too little that someone is going to this network on a daily basis. The idea behind that was, say, hey, let's build private networks within ResearchGate for institutions, which they have to pay because, for because we do some adjustments, additional applications, um, and then they having a benefit from both systems. One is the worldwide system, which is for free, and one is the institutional solution. Is it maybe too early for the institutional solution? So that new white didn't work for uh, It's uh, the, uh, no, this was, they built it on their own. Ah, and, okay. and that didn't work. Okay. The ResearchGate one is working much better than their, their old version. So they had their own network on their own website, okay. like Max Planck Net, I think. And, it didn't work. and this didn't work. Okay. And now they, you know, and this is why we didn't want to create parallel universes. So we didn't want to do la white labeling. The idea was not to say, okay, we create a research gate for these institutions, yeah. research gate. We want to have one big umbrella, and under this umbrella, this worldwide research gate, we want to have smaller private communities. Um, and the third idea is, um, which we have, is around products. So we want to create um, somehow a marketplace for products, by scientific products, uh, where companies can post their scientific products and they have to pay to get into the listing. And within ResearchGate, the users can compare these products, can uh, rate these products and comment these products. Um, and this is something where, again, the companies, the, buy the, the, the corporate has to pay, but the, again, free for the users. I think there are lots of ways, if you read our terms, you will see we're not allowed to um, we sell the data to a third party. Um, and I think there are ways to make revenue helping the scientists without squeezing out um, the, the knowledge and the data of the scientists. Okay. Would you be willing to share your business models as, uh, as to today and tomorrow with us as well, Lou? <laughs> Is that okay? Or? That's not really something that I want to comment on um, in a great deal. But I will say that, yeah, um, 
the idea of subcommunities is obviously um, you know something that I was um, alluding to before. It's something that we've done with the geographical hubs on Next Network. Um, it always um, it's something that I think would make sense to do further with the blogs aggregation um, that, that I talked about earlier too. So being able to come along and look at specific subject areas in more detail rather than just looking at all blogs in general. So I think this kind of fragmentation it, it, it is another one of those themes. Um, but we don't charge to use Nature Network. It's free for anybody to sign up, and um, there's no plan to do so in the near future. Yeah. Uh, 